Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the honor of serving as director of the Roosevelt House. I know most of you have heard my endless stories about the house, but for those who are new to us, this is, of course, the, uh, the one-time home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, who lived here for 25 years, starting in 1908 when FDR's mother built this house as a Christmas present for the happy couple um, and said, uh, uh, it only comes with one catch, I'm gonna live on the other side of the townhouse. And as Eleanor once confided, uh, once Franklin's mother took down the walls that separated the east and west portions, my mother-in-law was on my side of the house for the next 25 years, sometimes at the least expected moments. <laughs> leave, leave it to your imagination. Um, and also importantly, this was the place where Franklin uh, held his transition headquarters after his election in November 1932. And 90 years ago, Francis Perkins walked in to be interviewed for the job as Secretary of Labor. Uh, she, was, she was working for Roosevelt in the state administration. She came in and FDR said, Francis, I want to make you the first woman to ever serve in the cabinet. And she said, Governor, I'll do it, but I can't replicate her pause, but, but you have to pledge to let me work on minimum wage, maximum hours, and what we called old age pensions. So this is the place where Social Security was born. Uh, in concept. And now, we're also proud to mark and celebrate the publication of the new book, The Peer Effect, How Your Peers Shape Who You Are and Who You Will Become, by our own esteemed Roosevelt House peer, Margaret Chin and Syed Ali. Margaret is a faculty associate in the Roosevelt House Public Policy Program. She's a professor of sociology at Hunter College, and as of the summer, I think, the new chair of the department. I'm sure that's great fun, Margaret, right? <laughs> we last had the pleasure of hosting her um, as part of the online event series we launched and maintained during the pandemic. It seems so long ago, but it was called Hunter at Home, and this is where she discussed her previous book, Stuck, Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder, about how racial and ethnic inequality limit upward mobility in the corporate world. Um, I'm just happy that Margaret is back on 65th Street uh, in person to talk about her latest book, and that she used this time so profitably <laughs> to write another book. Um, we're very pleased to welcome, for the first time, Syed Ali, uh, her co-author, professor of sociology at LIU uh, in Brooklyn. He is the author of Dubai Gilded Cage. It's a great title, Syed. And the co-author of Migration, Incorporation, and Change in an Interconnected World, and co-editor of The Context Reader. He's also a graduate like Margaret and our moderator, who I'll just describe in a moment, Ada Calhoun, uh, I guess of, of Stuyvesant High School. Um, <laughs> the next best thing to Hunter High School, I think. <laughs> um, but but uh, that commonality figures prominently in the genesis of and the research for the book that brings us here tonight, as you might, as you might hear. So the Peer Effect was published just a couple of weeks ago, and it's already been met with enthusiastic praise. It's been called praise. It's been called a stunning book on the power of our peers in shaping who we are and how we interact in the world. And as a must read for any parent, educator, policymaker, organizational leader, or former student, for understanding not just schools, and I'm quoting here, but how we can socialize one another into being better people. 
Now, most of you, most of us, especially the parents in the room, will be familiar with the term peer pressure, but this is not that. This is the peer effect, a term coined by Margaret and Syed to encapsulate the broader, the sometimes negative but often beneficial cultural impacts that peers have on one another across a range of contexts, from education to policing to the workplace. The book combines cutting edge research with biography and offers overdue insights on how, how we are all affected by the groups to which we belong, for better or for worse, I guess. As I said, joining Margaret and Syed in conversation this evening to host the conversation is best-selling author Ada Calhoun, whose most recent book, also a poet, Frank O'Hara, My Father and Me, was widely considered one of the best books of 2022. She is also the author of Why We Can't Sleep and St. Mark's is Dead. About the peer effect, she has said that it offers persuasive and refreshing perspectives on some of the toughest cultural conversations today. And so now to expand on those conversations, please welcome Margaret Chin, Syed Ali, and our moderator, Ada Calhoun. Thank you. What, um, what a treat to be here in this historic place and to get, um, to get a mini, mini lesson in its history. Uh, we got to see the, the fireplace where they had the fireplace chats just before coming down here. It's really, um, what a delight. And I'm so excited to be here with both of you and all of you. Um, the, the cheer that went up for Stuyvesant High School are their fellow graduates here. Oh, yes. Hello. Hello. And were there Hunter High School graduates as well? Ah, uh, yes. OK, we will, we will rumble later. Um, oh, Bronx, Bronx Science is also in the house. There's one. OK, good. Brooklyn Tech, anyone? All right. Um, and Hunter College graduates. How many of those do we have? Oh, a couple. Yeah. Um, what an incredible place. It's, uh, it's historic and important in more ways than one. Um, and I hope this will be a conversation that we can all, we can all have with these incredible scholars. Uh, I'm going to, I'll kick it off. I'll, I'll talk with them for maybe 20 minutes or so, half an hour. And then um, I will encourage you to, to fling questions at us. There are a lot of people also watching on Zoom, I think there's another you know, 100 or something people out there um, who don't get to ask questions. Only you do. So well done showing up. Um, OK, so uh, I'd like to just maybe start by introducing you both, letting you introduce yourselves um, and your life in New York and your, your family in New York. I know a lot of your family is here. Um, what was it like growing up? What was your childhood like in, in, ca in a little capsule? So I grew up in the cultural and physical hinterland of Staten Island. And, <laughs> and I went to Stuyvesant from 82 to 85, and I was one of these people who took the test the second time back when they, they allowed that. So I was not one of the brighter bulbs of, uh, of Stuyvesant. But it was going to Manhattan was a, was a huge deal, right? Coming from 80s Staten Island, very kind of like remote, uh, to put it nicely. and. Uh, to be in, in Manhattan was just, a, it was transformative. It was, it was amazing. And to be among Stuyvesant people was amazing also. I'll say more about that a little later. Yeah, sure. So um, I grew up actually on the projects on the Upper West Side behind Lincoln Center. So a lot of people don't know and don't have an idea, have a clue that there are projects behind there. Because when you go to Lincoln Center, you only see it if you go to the back wall. But um, my father was a, um, a waiter. My mother was a garment worker. I was born in New York City. And um, every day I would wake up and I would see these great white buildings thinking, wow, it's so nice in there. But I have to do a, a little extra long walk to get around there. But the people on the other side just kind of showed up but had no clue that actually that there were people on the other side. But, um, and I'll tell you more about that. And what I actually learned at Stuyvesant was that that was the most diverse place I ever was up until the time I went to Stuyvesant because the majority of the people I grew up with were mostly black and Puerto Rican. Um, okay, so you, so you arrive at, at Stuyvesant High School and, um, and we call it the, the old building, right? Because of course there's a new one down um, 
down in Battery Park City now, but we went to the old building. Um, what did you find? So the, the old building, for those of you who don't know, was on 15th and 1st. And so it's on the edge of Loisaida, on the edge of, uh, of Union Square Park in the village. And it was just a, an introduction to like, just amazing things and places, right? Music and clubs and art and all, all this stuff. And so, and the people at Stuyvesant was, it, it was such a, a change coming from Staten Island, very, very white, very Italian, very regressive. And uh, Stuyvesant, it was this incredible mix of, you know, Asian people, and I never went to school with Asian people, so that was a new thing for me. Uh, you know, like black and Puerto Rican and, and you know, like rich white kids from Brooklyn Heights and Park Slope and, you know, Forest Hills and the Air Force side. And so culturally, it just, it was a complete shift in, in mindset and of what was possible, right? Just meeting all these people who had access to things that I didn't know existed, right? That knowledge and money and, and just like coolness that I, it was, you know, it was, it was just really transformative. It changed, it, it changed me in a way that I would not have been changed had I gone to school in, in Staten Island. And so between being in Manhattan, especially there, I think in Chamber Street is probably a very different experience, but being in the village and, you know, like trying to dodge heroin needles in Union Square Park on the way to, way to school, it just normalized things that other people would not understand. Yeah, so for me, it was really transformative too, in, in a different kind of way, because I met people there that were, um, when <coughs> I went there in 1980, it was about 15% black and Latino, 15% um, uh, Asian American, and about 70% white. So it was quite a different mixture of people um, there. So it was kind of very new. And as I described in, in something else I was talking about, it's like I had never gone to a restaurant, Western restaurant before in my life. I've only been to Chinese restaurant up until that time. And I thought a Western restaurant was actually McDonald's. <laughs> and I learned that it wasn't when I got to um, Stuyvesant. And moreover, I think the I think we found the peer effect there because I think um, when we got there, it was something that was kind of inspiring to us. It was something that um, that showed us that we could actually do more. But the thing is, everybody around us felt that they could do more. They could go to college. They felt like they could, and so we kind of fell into that. And I have to say that it's a special place because all kinds of populations, even going back 100 years. The school was founded in 1904, and there were no tests back then, it was all boys. Five years later, 80% um, of the graduating class went to um, college, which was very different. In 1909, about 25% of the graduates actually went to college. And it stayed that way all the way through when it became co-ed, when it had a test, and then up until the time we got there with new immigration, and even when you know um, it was the quite diverse, racially diverse group that we were there. So the peer effect existed the whole time. It encouraged people to go to college no matter what, even if you didn't have the test. And I think it's because seniors passed down to the freshmen. I got in there when I was a freshman. You know, to the freshmen, what you needed to do and to share that you can do it too. And I think that was the most inspiring part about Stuyvesant for me that I could do it too. And I think, you know, a lot of the graduates here, and many people here, I think we interviewed, too, felt that way as well. That was I, how I, we originally met, I think, when you were first starting to work on, uh, on this book. Um, you all wrote this amazing article in 2018 for The Atlantic, I think you wrote a couple. Um, there's one, you know, that got a lot of attention. Um, I'm just gonna read a little bit of it. Um, New York City's specialized high schools are a model of opportunity. They have stellar academic records and being public, they are free to attend. Their alumni tend to go on to elite colleges and prestigious careers. Together, the schools serve close to 18,000 students each year and at eight of the nine schools, admission is determined based on how middle schoolers do on a standardized test. Um, and earlier this month, New York City's mayor, Bill de Blasio, put forward a radical proposal, get rid of the test. So uh, a lot of people have very strong feelings about that. I wonder if, if you can quickly bring us up to date on what happened in reaction to, to his um, proposal, to your article about it, um, and what's happened since. 
So when de Blasio made this proposal in June of 2018, it was a kind of news dump. He did it on a late Friday afternoon, and it took everybody by surprise. Like, no one expected it. Like, he didn't consult with the NAACP. He didn't consult with any of the more kind of uh, uh, left-leaning Asian American groups. Like, none of these people who you would think would be his political allies he, did he consult with. And it, it just seemed to be kind of like a political, political ploy, especially because the test is written into law, right? It's in the, the heck Calandra Act of 1971 mandates that Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech have our admission by exam only. So he didn't have the power to just change it by fiat, he would, or even by, through city council, he would have to go through, go through the state. And so there was like a lot of hubbub, and we had, the article, we had actually proposed it to the Atlantic earlier, and they had passed, and they said, yeah, that's not really interesting. And then he makes this announcement, and I wrote back to the editor, he's like, yeah, okay, let's, let's, get, this, let's get this rolling. And so the, the article uh, really, uh, the main argument was that like what Stuyvesant is is not about the teachers, and it's not about the resources, and in fact, when we went there, it was the Bunsen burners were probably original 1904 equipment, <laughs> right? And when they built the, the new building, we all, like, they would take us on these tours, and we we're all just, like, looking at it, like, wow. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have a nice life here. But it was not back then, right? The, the old building was decrepit, even relative to other New York City high schools that, that were built later. And so the argument that we had was that what makes Stuyvesant, and by extension, tech and, and science, and these other types of schools, special is the kids who are there, right? And so we learn from them, and there's this, and you learn it two ways, right? One is a direct peer effect, not peer pressure, but you want to be like the people that you're around. And the other is a kind of culture of achievement that the students at these, at these places have, where you kind of learn, it's in the air, and you learn very quickly that you're here to do well, right? You're here to like not just pass, but you're going to you're going to get decent grades, and you're going to graduate and go on to good universities and whatnot. And back then, the school was, behind the school was a park, and Beth Israel Hospital was, was across the street. And you could go into the park at pretty much any time of the morning or the afternoon. And even on a clear blue sky day, it would be covered in a gray cloud of smoke, and people getting high and drunk, and the students getting high and drunk on the, on the benches, and teachers walking through them and paying, paying no mind, because they knew that these kids are going to be going to be fine, right? You're you're passed out, drunk or, or high, but those guys are all going to be doctors and, and and lawyers and bankers <laughs> and engineers, and there was no doubt about this. So that when when this article came out, when De Blasio made his announcement, it was a it was a really big deal, and this went on for like a good year of like controversy, protests. Eric Adams was initially for getting rid of the test until he gave a speech at a fundraiser for uh, that uh, Chinese uh, restaurant workers had for him. And they pretty much told him what was what. They're like, you're not going to get any money. You're not going to get any support. And he did a 180. He was like, we're not getting rid of the test. And, the, and basically, the, the, you know, Carranza came in, and he made his thing. But then John Liu, who is the chair of the Education Committee of the State Senate, who graduated from Bronx Science, he just put his foot down and said, yeah, I'm not releasing this for consideration for the, for the broader Senate. And that pretty much ended that. And then soon after, Adams gets elected mayor, and he's, it's not even become an issue again. Yeah, and so to add to that, one complication or one big factor about why they wanted to get rid of the test was the number of black and Latino students who are at Stuyvesant now or even in 2018. So when we were there, it was about 120 to 150. You know, it was 15% or so. So that's a lot compared to lately, you only have seven black and Latino kids or seven black kids and 20 Latino kids there. So people were trying to figure out how can we make it more equitable, make a school like this more equitable. It's always been a place where people who are strivers, it's a great place for um, social mobility, um, to pro help propel all of the people in New York City. It's a public school. It should address everyone in the city. So that was one of the, the reasons why they thought about getting rid of the test. And I think the article was a shocker in that it talked about how Stuyvesant was like when we were there. 
It talked about how diverse it was. And people realized that part of the reason why it was diverse was that the schools itself, the middle schools, were very different. They had programs, in, they had schools in every single neighborhood, segregated neighborhoods, when we were growing up. And in each one of these schools, there were classrooms where kids, black kids, Latino kids, Asian American kids, can learn um, higher level material so that they can take tests to get in. So when we were younger, they had that. None of us prepped. We didn't prep to get into Stuyvesant, but it was an opportunity, there was an opportunity for everybody to take this test to get in because there was actually a different kind of a school system. After Bloomberg came in, the school system changed. So the school systems changed so that gifted programs or accelerated learning programs were pulled out of each of these separate schools and they were put into, I mean, each of the neighborhood schools and were put into gifted programs so that only uh, kids who lived by those gifted programs or had parents who knew about these gifted schools could send their kids there. So there was a dramatic shift in the, in the population who could actually um, take the test and do well. And that was a big worry about, you know, the value of this test, would it really test if, school, if kids weren't able to learn the material? So all of that was in the article, and I think that's what, I think, galvanized people to, um, you know, really think, we should think about this issue. But in the end, as you said, we're, we, we still have this system. But we have to remember, this system only educates 6% of the New York City high school population. We still have 94% we have to deal with. Just as a side note, I see a lot of people of a, of a certain age, and a lot of you were in SP, SP programs, and that's what we used to call honors, and that was in pretty much every school, nearly every school in the, in the city. And sometime in the 90s, they disappeared. And it's not clear when, and it's not clear why, and nobody could tell me how that, how that happened. Like Norm, Norm Fruchter, who is like a big education advocate and, and scholar of education, he didn't know. Harold Levy, the former chancellor, couldn't tell me. Like uh, the researcher in the library of the Department of Education, he didn't know either. So if anybody knows, we'd love to, I would love to hear this later. <laughs> um, yes, actually, why don't we talk just a little more too about the, the, the broader um, educational system in New York. I think that you do such a beautiful job in this book. And by the way, I should say that the book is for sale and it, the holidays are coming up. Um, so <laughs> get them for all your family and friends for Under the Tree. Um, you do this amazing job of talking about the, the costs of segregation in the New York City school system um, and how it happened and the, the, the attempts to fix it, you know, often rather comical and, you know, and, and tragic in various ways. Um, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about that and about how, how that figured into your research um, and how it was an example of the effect you were talking about. Well, the kind of initial thing was through, this, through the SPSP stuff. And the, the, I mean, why? So one of the questions that we started with was what happened to the demographics? So when, when we went to, to, to Stuyvesant, it was the school historically had been largely Jewish, right? And it was male until, I forget what year. 1972. 72, yeah. right? So, so it was male and it was largely Jewish. And, you know, it was very similar at Brooklyn Tech and, uh, sorry, at uh, Bronx Science. And in the 70s, you start to have uh, Asian immigration, right? As a result of the 1965 immigration law. And so by the 80s, by the time Margaretson School and then me later, uh, you, you have a sizable Asian American population. The white population is shrinking and the black and Latino population is in this 20, 25% range. And then by the late 80s, the black and Latino population is shrinking a bit and the Asian population is growing. And then into the 90s, it's you know the black and Latino population down, down, down. Asian population going up, up, up. The white population kind of remaining flat. And then in the early 2000s, under Bloomberg, there's a, there's a huge shift, which is he started uh, small schools, right? So most of us went to very large, like if you were in New York, you went to a large public high school, right? If, and like a non-specialized school, you went to 
you know, Wagner High School or Martin Luther King or, you know, some 3,000, 4,000 size school, and those began to disappear, largely under, under Bloomberg, and he cut up, the, cut up the schools, and he instituted a lot of screens, right, in the middle school. So then you had to, like, it was no longer you went to your local public school, to your local middle school, to your local high school. That all kind of went out the window over a period of a few years. And the, so then what happens is the public schools become a little bit more segregated than, than they were even, I mean, it's always been segregated, right? Like the, your local school is with your neighborhood and your neighborhoods are segregated, but it becomes even more so with school choice under, under Bloomberg to the point where with the screens, the screens became so widespread and screening for things like grades or sometimes they have their own tests or portfolios or whatever. And so then you had this kind of shunting of like black and Latino kids into these types of schools and white and Asian kids into these, these types of schools. And it got so dire that when de Blasio comes in, he starts this discussion of, you know, we need to have more diversity. He wouldn't use, he never used the term desegregation. He wouldn't use it, he wouldn't say it. And then Carranza comes in from, right, he's from Houston and San Diego. He's like, look at this, <laughs> this place is so segregated, we have to do something about it. It's, it created this huge hubbub, and then they started, they said, okay, we're not gonna desegregate the system as a whole, but we'll let individual districts take a shot. And the only district that really did it was District 15 in Brooklyn that covers parks, so richer areas of Park Slope and Borum Hill, and poor areas of Sunset Park and, and, and Red Hook, right? It's a huge geographical district with like, hundred thousand students or so and that so then they desegregated those schools they got rid of the screens and the schools that were very white uh, not many Asian people live in Asian Americans live in uh, district 15 very white they very quickly got a lot more black and Latino students in them and the ones that were more heavily black and Latino got a smaller trickle of white students in them Um, so the book is, it's very New York in a lot of ways, but you also go international at various points. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, um, the foreign research you did and about you know, other places outside of the city. I, I, it's, it's hard to remember there are them, but yes. <laughs> yeah, so when we, looked at the, when we looked at the peer effect, we were trying to figure out, are there other places around the world? Um, we looked at different school systems. So we looked at Finland, we looked someplace, um, looked at Asia, we looked mostly at, at Amanda Ripley's work, you know, and her work really showed that in places like Finland, the kids were left to do as they wanted to do. They could go out, they could, um, they had much more freedom, they had much more trust among each other, and even about with the teachers, and the teachers were really well trained, and this was very similar to Asia too. The teachers were very well trained, but I think the kids didn't have as much freedom. But there in Finland, the kids had freedom. And it's kind of like what we, what we felt like at Stuyvesant High School. And because you were given this freedom, and because, and it, it, but in Finland, their peer effect was that school, you went to school, and you did well in school, you passed the test, and then you left. But you knew that in school, you would just do well in school. And so the peer effect there was that school is for school, and we expect to graduate and go off to college much, very much similar to the way we felt at Stuyvesant. Although it was a different system, a different country, and the students were completely different, we were often left uh, to feel that very same way. So I talked to some Finnish educators uh, when we started this thing, and I asked them about, I wanted to know if they had their version of Stuyvesant. And they just didn't understand the question. And they were like, what do you mean you have this very elite school where only it's only open to a certain population. I'm like, I mean that. <laughs> like, do you have like a Stuyvesant? And they're like, no, we have schools. And that was kind of a shock. Like, they don't have the same kind of notion of good schools and bad schools. Here, once you have a kid, you live in New York, you start to pull your hair out. Where am I going to send my kid to school? But over there, it's not a, it doesn't matter because that school is the same as that school is the same as that school. There's not much difference. And you know, some of the criticism of that is like, well, okay, it's ethnically homogenous. And yeah, to a degree, but you look at the capital city and it's not fully ethnically homogenous. They have a very large immigrant and refugee population. And they're not 
uh, segregated into, like kind of funneled into, into one, or one or two schools, they're, they're spread out. And the, that to me was like a really amazing thing, right? Like it was very different from, from our experience. I mean, the American educational system from the beginning has been has been segregated, right? That's like baked into how we do how we do education here. So that like like that kind of set off like you know the thinking of like okay, what is what does it mean to segregate your your schools beyond you know the kind of like you know Brown v Board of Ed thinking, but like what are the what are the ramifications of it, and what would an alternative look like? Like could we do that here? I mean the answer of course yeah you could. But politically, it would be suicide for any population, which is why any uh, politician, which is why they don't do it. Um, so you also talk about steroid use um, and police misconduct. And I wonder if you can give us just a little preview of how, how that worked in your research. So the so steroid use, the, so the, the book started off as initially it was supposed to be the peer effect, and we were going to look at different uh, issues of Stuyvesant High School. So we're going to look at black and Latino graduates, and we're going to look at you know, Asian American graduates, and we're looking at short-term effects and long-term effects. So we're, in, we're also interested in, you know, do people our age and older, like, is the effect going to go, you know, further on? And uh, that was the initial configuration of the book, and then we tried to sell the book, and nobody wanted to buy the book, and so then, you know, I, I had to rethink, you know, what is what is interesting here, and it, I realized, okay, I th was thinking that the book is the peer effect. They're thinking the book is about Stuyvesant, so I had to re rethink. So then, you know, it's one thing to write about kids, right? We all understand that peer effects affect that kids have peer effects, but nobody really talks about it among adults. And I thought, okay, this is important to look at adults. So then, you know, what are different areas that we could we could look at, and so I started just, you know, kind of searching, and like baseball came up, and I thought, okay, office misconduct. There's all these different types of offices. Baseball is also an office, right? It's an organization. You have people on the ground who are, you know, at the kind of level of, you know, like lower level, and then you have like people up in the up in the hierarchy. And it's the same whether you're looking at a school, whether you're looking at, you know, like a corporate office. They, it's structurally similar. So the the steroid stuff, it just kind of came to me, like I just came across it, and I was like, this is really interesting, a good way to kind of get into the thing. Uh, police misconduct, that was another one that kind of came up off kind of from the side. There's a great documentary on Netflix called The 7-5. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's w well worth seeing, and it's about corruption in the 75th uh, police uh, precinct in uh, East New York. And so I have a lot of friends who grew up who are my age, who grew up in East New York and, and uh, uh, Bed-Stuy and Brownsville. And we're talking one day, and we're talking about the, the film, and you know, the one guy who grew up in East New York was, uh, like, he would tell his wife stories about the police, and she wouldn't believe him. She's like, that couldn't happen. Like, she was from Southern Jersey. She's like, there's no way. He's like, I'm telling you. And then she saw the film. She's like, oh my god, <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, the, there was one cop who borrowed a ladder from the fire department next door, took it, so that he could climb into a drug dealer's apartment to, to rob him. But the point, the point was that we're, as we were talking, we're talking about police brutality that, of course, always comes up. And we, we kind of like talked about it, and it was like the cops didn't really shoot people that much back in the 70s into the, into the 80s. Like, yeah, there was police violence, right? We remember Michael Stewart being you know, beaten, killed by the by the transit police in 1983, but it was a one, it was like this thing happened and this was like a big deal. And it becomes much more common later on. And that kind of got me thinking, well, there's a culture here. What affects cultural shifts? Why, why does this happen, right? And so then that kind of led me into that. And it grew from like what was going to be like one small section into you know 30 page chapter. And then I think on the baseball, I think it's really, oh, sorry. Um, the part about the baseball that's really interesting is that it, we looked at um, 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 an article by economists, Eric Gould and Todd Kaplan, who basically research whether workers learn productive skills from their coworkers, even if it's unethical. And so they looked at baseball, they looked at Jose Canseco and his teammates, and they found that 
after he left the team, his teammates actually became better hitters after playing with him. So workers learn to be more productive, meaning steroid use, you know, because the culture of the team accepted that kind of behavior. And if you think about it, that's the kind of behavior we see sometimes in like, you know, Sam Bankman Freed. You know, there, there are things that we can see that is comparable. And that's why baseball was so interesting as one of the workplaces that was used in the book. So th there are all kinds of ways to think about this. And that's a peer effect that you see that gets transmitted by a small group and in group. How do you say this in group? How do you become more productive? And you could see it. So this is like the, the thread through the whole book now. It's like looking at cases of how we can see and how we could examine this peer effect. And I'm going to turn it over to you very soon. I know there are people who are chomping at the bit to ask questions. So, um, but first, I want to say there's you know there's a lot of of heaviness in the book, heavy subject matter, but also um, so much lightness. And I mean, I found myself laughing. There's there are a lot of um, there's a lot of very charming writing, and um, and it's very funny in places. Was it important to you in the in the writing to to make it not a dry academic tome, but in fact something that was relatable and something people could, could have you know, things that they could take away. Yeah, it was absolutely critical. And part of it is I only know how to write that way. I'm very bad as an academic and as an academic writer. And I would get in trouble with that a lot. And I, I always look to be just write better. Like, there's no point in doing something if it's just going to be for a couple of, of academics, right? It has to be for, for other people. And one of the great writing lessons I learned was from this wonderful book, no, really, Why, Why We Can't Sleep by, by Ada Calhoun. And it's a great sociology book, even though she's not a sociologist. But she does a phenomenal job of doing, of take, doing interviews with people, but then having the interviews really jump out and live on the, on the page and write as a narrative. It's storytelling. And I think academics forget that they're telling stories, right, whether you're sociologist or historian or a chemist, you're telling a story about how the world, how the world works. And so I think it's, it's really important for, I mean, like, and it can't be monotone. I mean, yeah, like bullying and, and you know, suicide and depression, these are very heavy topics, but you can't just have a book be droll like that and just like really, you know, like in, in that tone, like you have to shift tone here and here and there. And I think that's an important thing. Absolutely. And so when I first met Syed, I was writing for Context, which is what um, sociologists write for, pub for the public to read, short little articles that are just in plain old English. And Syed was my editor. And so he was, he is a great writer. So you have to admit that he's a great writer. He's funny. So he was editing my, my material. And I was like, this is so good. And so he has this talent. And so I learned a lot from writing in Context. And I learned a lot from writing this book and adding material to it. You know, adding material to the, the pages, making it lighter, and not being so academic about it. And I think that's really important as we are, you know, sociologists, as you said, we should learn to be more public sociologists, to learn to write for the greater audience. And I, so I think those are some of the great things. Great. OK, well, I, am, I think I am ready to turn it up. Oh, hands are shooting into the air. This is wonderful. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, yes, sir, let's start with you. You have to wait for the microphone because um, we are told that the people on Zoom can only hear the questions if it's into a microphone. Okay, first I'd like to comment on your question. The universities changed the entrance in the 1990s. They de-weighted the grades from New York City schools, taking out the honors and AP classes and recalculating the averages so that everybody had a fair shot. That was the rationale, and that happened, I believe, in that time frame. So it might, you might look at the broader context of the culture changing at that time. Um, you mentioned Finland. Denmark is the same way, and that's where Lego is. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at peer, when you look at Montessori schools, you'll see a model that's very similar to Denmark and Sweden, which are, by the way, are the happiest countries in the world, according to the UN. And the three values they really hold are my relationships with my neighbor, the, the environment, they're very environmentally sensitive, and the third one is community. 
and everything they do, they use those values. If we had some of those values, we might have not only a better education system, but a better society. Your thoughts? And the, the last one I want to mention is something that's missing from education, and it goes to peer. We are dropping the scientific method of thinking because that says a hypothesis, prove my hypothesis. Don't just accept what you're told by the media. Challenge what you think. And that is a big error or a big mistake or omission in the education system that I see. Just like we drop civics and American history from the curriculums. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, could we take the model from Denmark and Finland and apply it in a small environment like the Montessori schools do? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but, Let's do it, all of us. Well, Let's go. But I think the, but to me, the, the, the issue that goes along with it that we generally ignore is the segregation of the, of the schools, right? I mean, if we, like, we, we do have Montessori schools, but they're, you know, they tend to be privileged bastions. Right? I mean, you could apply it more broadly, but I think if, like, if you had like, more integrated schools, I mean, the, the basic thing, like, there's a lot of research uh, in, in uh, kind of uh, in education on peer effects, right? Like kids who go, to kid, who go to school in mixed environments, the kids who are poor and who are poor academically do better with kids who are better academically, right? It raises them up, and the kids who are better academically don't suffer in these environments. And this has been shown like all across the country in, in place after place. So like in terms of like the content of education, I, I actually don't think it matters all that much. Like I think it's 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 important, but this is a bigger issue to me. Yes, please. Oh wait for the microphone. Oh sorry. Did you have something else? Yes, yes. Oh by the way, one of the values they have in those schools and from Denmark, where Lego, by the way, was born and is used in the schools, is play. We need more play to have more peer interaction. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So um, can we run it to this gentleman here? While we're waiting for this, the this following one. on that, the, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis here. Well, we need like, you know, pre-K, 3K, we need kids to be in school longer. But like you said, like Finnish kids, Danish kids, they start school, and German kids, they start school way later, right? Seven years old. They play. Yeah. Yes, please. So this question is for Margaret, and it's, <clears throat> it's basically inspired by the, uh, by the title of her book, where Asian Americans and Corporate Ladder. Um, so I have a personal curiosity. Uh, in the recent past, uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, CEOs in the tech sector uh, who are uh, Indians, but they were Indians who grew up in India, and they came here and uh, as grad students or whatever, and then, but there are not too many um, Indian Americans who are uh, in that uh, overrepresented group. Any explanations? So I can only guess to that because when I did my um, research in my book, I interviewed mostly second generation at 1.5, meaning they were born here or they came here before the age of 13 or brought up here. But a lot of people ask me that question and I try to think about the research and why that would be the case. And I think if you grow up in a country like in India where you are one of the majority, you learn a different way of acting. You learn a different way of carrying yourself and it could also be that you could be part of a, a caste system too. You know, so all of those are factors where you come here and you may be more confident, you may carry yourself differently, you may have that even have a better education in your home country than the people who are um, brought up here, who are Asian Americans who are from all, you know, the Asian American population in the US is very, very diverse. And in New York City, we actually have the, one of the highest uh, poverty levels in New York City. So it's a very different population, the Asian Americans who grew up here and who were born here, than the ones who came from overseas. So those are two possibilities. Um, yes, right here, please. Oh, I th we for the, sorry, wait for the microphone so that this, our friends on Zoom don't yell at us. If peer influence can be looked at as a totality of stimuli, 
that an individual will receive through his lifetime. And it could be very nurturing, and it could be very destructive. My question is, how do we educate our young people so that they know the difference? How do we start so that there is a baseline for that moral compass upon which you, know, you base your analytical thinking, the sciences, the behavior sciences, where it's interpersonal relationships, those things that are very soft, and yet those are very important. It could be hugely destructive if you don't get a good handle on it. So I, I am interested not about the testing to get into colleges, get into high school. I'm interested in the, the character that you need to have so that you can make that distinction. Because where do you go to a top-notch school because you score well, or you went to a regular school and did an ordinary job? But if your moral compass is correct, you'll be the best citizen there is. And that is the only way to deal with this totality of inferences so that it becomes nurturing for all of us, not just for that individual. So, so parents are very limited <laughs> in what they can do with their children, and you can't teach them. I mean, you can teach them, and they will learn it, and they will tell you about it, and then they'll walk out the door, and then they're different people. Right? Maybe they're similar, maybe they're radically different. But we as parents don't have a lot of control over that, right? Especially given, I mean, this is also variable from country to country, society to society, but here, once they walk out their door, once they go into daycare, right, all bets are off. Like, we can have an indirect influence by, you know, like choosing neighborhoods, choosing schools, but that just shapes the population of possible peers and then the kids choose them and you know the peers choose choose the choose the kids and basically hope for the best is is really what it comes down to there's something reassuring about it i think there's been so much pressure on parents to control every aspect um, i think you mentioned you know the battle hymn of the the tiger mom and um, these uh, these other books um, and blogs that are all about how how parents should craft every little bit of their child's life and he's no, don't don't bother. But just yeah, right. And the this other is frees one thing, up so much time. I'm, and right. this is probably something that you found, Ada, in right, in, your, in the book oh. with with a lot of the the parents. Like this is one more thing that they're trying to control and fret yeah, over. Yeah. So you have you have freed you have freed them all. Yes. So right. well done. But, but I think the other side of it too is like our atmosphere and what we talk about in general, because kids will pick up, right? We also have to have more conversations in the world, the news media, everything around the world, so that kids actually see what's going on in the world too. Not to say that they'll actually do it, not to say that you know they'll actually abide by it, but they need to be exposed to all of these different things. Like I agree, we don't talk that much about civics. We don't talk that much about morals. And we do see a lot of things that you know, are, are in the news where people are just angry at each other. So I think that more of this other side has to be exposed, you know, and then we can't control what the kids actually pick and what they want to do, but at least that actually helps bring different modes of conversation into their brain so at least they can debate it themselves. I love the question too also about like, you know, how do we define success? Yeah. Right? Is, it, is it being a good person or is it getting into a good school? And I thought that the first questioner had some beautiful um, points about that too. There's a uh, woman in the back there. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, just following up on um, that concept of how to have children or even adults behave in a more civic manner. I'm, um, I uh, haven't had an opportunity to you to read the book yet but I was thinking of uh, Daniel Kahneman's totally different, thinking fast and slow, and how a huge percentage of people will respond in a predictable way, uh, and how depressing to me that was, because it can be positive influences or negative influences, 
and, and yet people reacting to stimuli maybe are trained or uh, tend to respond in a certain way. Um, but putting that aside, I just wanted to ask, was there anything that surprised you in, in your interviews and in your research about uh, and how areas where maybe the peer effect is not as strong that people somehow uh, think for themselves, for lack of a better word. Hmm. I think, I, go, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say that, you know, among our peers, the Cybercent students that we talked to, it was a variety of students from different backgrounds in different years. Um, we interviewed back to the 1970s, but we didn't interview any real current students, which I think may, there may be differences there. But I do think that what I found that was really striking was that people had this view of what, um, what going to school meant to them, right? But it all still, in the end, however they went to school, whatever clubs they, they went to, they felt a connection, like you said, with somebody. And they felt that somebody there in the school could actually help them. Almost everybody said that. Even if they had like negative views of the school, they felt like there was somebody there. So that was a little surprising, is that they found this connection. Almost all the people, maybe it was a, a selection thing where we, we interview people who had positive ideas about Cybersent, but that was one thing that I felt was actually surprising, that people did have that feeling about Cybersent. So it could be positive or negative, but they had this connection to the place. So it's a small thing, but I thought it was worth you know mentioning. One thing that did kind of, uh, I don't know if it surprised me, but it came out as uh, the book was coming along, was that peer effects are not Absolute, in the sense that the their like peer groups have they have cultures, they have their own culture, right? And they have their own ways of doing things, right? What's right, what's wrong, their own norms, and the norms don't cover everything. So there's some stuff that you do that isn't affected by this. So for instance, like for among the people that we that we interviewed, like religion didn't really come up as something that peers had a direct effect on, right? That was something you did at home and for us who went to school before the 90s, right? So in the 90s, you have this multicultural term, right? The, the term is coined, multiculturalism in Canada. And you don't really start talking about, right, culture. Like, nobody's interested in people's home culture. It's like, well, OK, you're Thai, you're Chinese, I'm Indian, American, whatever. I don't care about what you do at home. I don't care about your language or your food. It's time to go get drunk. <laughs> right, that's that. That's it. So the some stuff does not get right as part of it. And then you think about other schools. So the the culture at Stuyvesant, at Science, at Hunter, the, is very much like a very centered around education. But other schools don't have that, right? So like a kid can be like you know failing classes. That does not affect you know his or her standard standing among among his peers. But it's at you know at these schools that would not that doesn't that doesn't fly. Okay, I think we we have what time for what one or two more? Do we feel two? Oh, two. We've been granted two. Okay, um, so yes, I think you had your hand up first. As I listen to this, what I seem to come away with is a feeling that individuals, parents, whatever, have only um, a moderate amount of influence they can have on their children. So the single most important thing you can do is encourage your kids to have the right friends. And by that, I don't mean the richest kids, the entitled kids, the ones that belong to the right country clubs, but the kids that have what you believe the right sense of values are. And if you can do that successfully, you've accomplished a great deal. If you can do that, you're also a little bit of a miracle worker. Because <laughs> kids, they, they don't listen. They, they do what they want. Some, I mean, sometimes it does dovetail, right? You like this girl. I want Janie to hang out with this girl. And Janie hangs out with that girl. Sometimes you get lucky, 
and other times, not so much. Yeah, I have to agree with that. You're very lucky. <laughs> okay, I think we've got time for one last one. It's very hard to pick, but I think you were the, the most enthusiastic arm, <laughs> so I'm gonna go, go for that and if, bring us home with oh, a good question, no pressure. Oh, oh, wait, wait for your um, oh, sorry. microphone. Hi, my name's Catherine. I'm a Hunter alumna, class of 88, old. I'm doing my doctoral dissertation on gender and culture. I'm studying Chinese women in the workforce. And um, this was very interesting to me because I'm looking at culture and I'm looking at gender. And I thought this was going to talk more about the organization, also a psychologist. And I'm wondering, um, when I think about the peer effect, I wonder how that looks like within the organizational context because we're looking at context here. And in every single context, we do behave very differently in terms of, you know, the inf I think Dr. Cialdini did the work on persuasion, persuasion on influence um, in, at Arizona University some years and years ago. So I'm, I'm just wondering how that ties in and how you could give us also a formal definition of the peer effect so that I could really, really understand how you're using it. And I apologize, I haven't read your book yet. Right, so I'll, I'll talk about the last part. I think that one of the easiest way to think about the peer effect is you think about within any group, there's an in-group and an out-group. And the in-group is the one that is what most kids, adults, everybody wants to be a part of. And that could be, you could have bad influences or you could have really good influences. That's a simple, a very simple way of thinking about it, but that's an easy way of defining a peer effect. So in our book, we talk about organizations in terms of um, diversity. So we didn't talk about women or culture, but in terms of how do you build more diversity in organizations? Because organizations generally um, reproduce itself. The people in the organizations reproduce themselves. There's tons of studies that show that, you know, the organizations, the CEOs are mostly white. You know, the numbers are, right now we have eight S&P 500 companies um, who have black CEOs, 22, um, are Latino, Hispanic, 42 are Asian American. So very few of 500 companies, you know, are non-white leaders. So how do you do that? And in our book, when we wrote it, we were talking about affirmative action. We were talking about how important it is to use rules, set up rules to bring in people. But then once you're inside, pe inside the organization, we're talking about how important it was to have peer effects. If you bring in people, hopefully, enough people, not just one or two, or, or have a, a one-off um, diversity seminar, or have people just do the IAT tests, you know, implicit bias tests, but actually have people there that could maybe, hopefully, start changing the culture in the organizations. And that's bringing more than just a few people. It means bringing in a lot. So that means you set up structures to do that. So that's, what, that's a little bit of what we talk about in our book. Are good? Okay, um, well, so I know a lot of other people had questions, and I think, I'm, I'm sure you will answer them. At, there's gonna be a reception, is that right? Yes, okay, we have a reception. You can buy your books for all your family and friends and get them signed, I think. And thank you so much, Saya. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.